Irenaeus is one of these early church fathers, one of those who, who writes in living memory of, of the apostles who, who heard Jesus, one of these guys who learns from the, the, the feet of those who learn from Jesus. And it's a fantastic uh, source, resource, Irenaeus, for learning about what the early church looked like. And this episode, this fantastic action-packed episode, uh, is all about that. I am joined by Dr. Matthew J. Thomas to talk about Irenaeus and the picture he gives us of the early church. And we dig in here to who Irenaeus was, what the church looked like at, at that time, and all the, these, these nuances about the things we can learn. From, from Irenaeus, which circles around the question for me as a convert to Catholicism from an evangelical background is, who is Irenaeus? What, what is he in, in the end? Is he going to come out in favor of, of, of the Catholic faith? Or is he going to sound more like an evangelical when we get down to the things he actually believes and then the picture he gives us of the church? That's in this conversation and so much more. And it's a lot a lot of fun. Dr. Matthew J. Thomas on Irenaeus, Catholic or Evangelical. Please watch, please subscribe to this channel while you're here and enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I want to remind you, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. Please make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you get notifications when new videos, new episodes come out each and every week. And if you're listening on podcasts, thank you. Please make sure to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And uh, find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash the cordial catholic. Uh, this week's conversation is going to be, um, well, I don't know what we're getting into here because I'm joined by a returning guest, Dr. Matthew J. Thomas. He is a DPhil from Oxford, uh, University of Oxford. He's the Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology and the author of Paul Works of the Law in the Perspective of Second Century Reception. Fantastic book. And uh, he's our return guest this week. Uh, welcome back to the program, uh, Dr. Thomas. Thank you for being here. And hello. Thank you very much, Keith. It is I'm a pleasure to be here with you again. <laughs> okay, I'm a bit concerned about this episode as we begin, Dr. Thomas, yep. because I feel like um, uh, we're friends. We we joke around a lot, and I feel like this might just end up being uh, one big, um, I don't know, inside joke. <laughs> I agree with that. Exactly. <laughs> I don't find it in any way concerning. So. <laughs> I love it. Before we yeah. hit the record button for the audience, uh, we were already having a really good time. And so this is going to be a fun episode. Uh, great guest to talk to. I'm really excited to have you on to talk about uh, Irenaeus and uh, unpack one of these fantastic uh, early church fathers, uh, now a doctor of the church. I want to say before we dig too deeply into this and get into our topic, uh, uh, Dr. Thomas, your your book, I had to do a little quick look on Amazon. I don't know if you know this or not, but your book, there are literally in Amazon.ca, two copies left in Canada of your book, wow. right? Wow. And three copies left on Amazon.com. So if really? listeners want to get a copy of this book, they better hurry up when this episode comes out and grab your book as soon as possible because uh, obviously it's not popular at all. It's, yeah, it's if there's any pawn shop owners who are listening, this would be a good time <laughs> to go and grab one of those because unless they're doing a second printing of it, you know, it might yeah. be a good investment. Yeah. So I know a lot of people are divesting from, you know, more traditional currencies right now and you know, with everything happening in the world, uh, either going to Bitcoin or, you know, uh, you know, the Japanese yen, you might consider investing in Paul's works a lot <laughs> second century reception. It seems like it's, uh, it seems like it's go going up in value pretty quickly. That's a, it's, it's, it's a hot commodity. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a fantastic book. Doesn't it, it doesn't help the, uh, the sales that, uh, the little unknown professor called N.T. Wright called it theologically explosive. I think that, uh, maybe, uh, helped the, the marketing plan for the, for the book. I think I attribute all of the success to the title. It's, it has one of those catchy titles that just rolls off the tongue that I don't think anybody can really resist. So it does. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that thing, that's where it comes from. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I appreciate, I appreciate Tom's support. I'm really grateful for it, but I really think it all comes down to the title. I don't know what you call literary, literary earworm, you know, a title that gets stuck in your head and you just can't stop thinking about it. But this is definitely one of them. <laughs> <laughs> this would be, uh, I think more than an earworm. I think yeah. that this would, uh, what's, What's there's one of those really really long worms. Have you ever seen one of those? 
They're like, they're like, in like hidden to like intestines or something like that, and it like just goes on for like miles. I'm that's basically the that's <laughs> basically the title because it's that long. So yeah, that's what it's a tapeworm. Thank you. It's not an earworm; it's a tapeworm. It's a literally a tapeworm. <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay, yeah. the matter at hand before us is Irenaeus, um, one of these the the early church fathers. Uh, I want to let you introduce him and tell us a bit more about him, but I want to frame it our conversation a little bit in this way because. For me and a lot of people who begin to look into the Catholic faith, we, we, <laughs> my, my good friend Rod Bennett tells it this way in one of his books. He was literally in this Christian bookstore and encountered these kind of shining tomes at the back of the store and pulled off the shelf. And it was these giant, these giant anti Nicene church father collect, the, collected works, like 1,200 pages. And he was gobsmacked to learn that these people existed, these people who are writing, you know, in, in living memory of the apostles who are saying, you know, who have things to say and give us a picture of the early church. He was gobsmacked to learn that. I was equally gobsmacked to to learn that. I I didn't find the the book in a Christian bookstore. I purchased it for $4 on on PDF on Amazon, the whole 1,200-page collection. But finding these church fathers for many for many uh, non-Catholic Christians, is a complete game changer. I know that that word's a little bit cliche, that term, but it really, it, it does change the playing field when you encounter writings that are so close to the New Testament that give us a picture of what the early church looked like. And that picture is oftentimes a little bit shocking. So tell us in that context, who is this guy, Irenaeus? Uh, where is he writing? Who's he writing to? What's he, what's he writing? What, what, what's his deal, Dr. Thomas? Yeah, awesome. Um, thanks, for Keith. I, I just want to say also, I love, I love the way that you host this. I was talking to some <laughs> of my students earlier, there, and I, was like, I think that, I feel like Keith is probably my favorite host of any, any podcast. He is, if there's some kind of, uh, I don't know, explosive endorsement I, I can give <laughs> for your hosting voice. I just honestly, I really enjoy it. So the first thing that I want to say um, is a recommendation that everybody turn off your podcast right now and go and pick up the works of Irenaeus. Um, stop listening. You might not ever listen again. You might come back if you do. That's great. Um, but my my honestly, the recommendation, if there's one thing that you remember, um, you can forget my name and Keith's name in my book and everything else. If you if you pick up the writings of Irenaeus and just start going through them, um, I, I went through over the past few weeks. I, I reread the, the five books of the Kansas Heresies. And I am persuaded that there is not a more impar- important theologian in Christian theological history. Um, I don't think that there is one. And that's not because I don't love all of the rest of the theologians. And when I say theologian, I, you know, I, I would be talking in terms of sort of, you know, post apostolic. Um, I'm not saying, yeah, gosh, uh, uh, St. Paul's, you know, footnotes to Irenaeus or anything like that. But as, as far as post apostolic writers, I, I just don't know anybody who I would say is more significant than Irenaeus. And honestly, it's hard for me to say that there's, you know, one that I would say is just more, just pure joy to read. Um, And again, that's not because there's not a lot of great alternatives. There really are. They're all, they're all a joy in their their own way. Um, But I think Irenaeus, I think because he's so early and I think because of the scope of his theology, um, what you notice when you come to Irenaeus, regardless of what kind of you know, Christian background you're coming from, or even if you're not coming from any kind of Christian background at all, honestly, um, what's so striking is already in 180 AD when Irenaeus is writing, so many of the things that we, as I think, you know, relative outsiders to early Christianity and people who for most of us don't, don't study this professionally, um, so many things that we think of later developments or later ideas, we see already in such a developed and thought through form already in the late 100s. And it's, it's honestly, it's, it's unbelievable to see the, the witness to the faith in this expansive, just beautifully developed form. Um, it's, it's honestly, it's a, it's a life-changing experience. I, I first read through all of Irenaeus in 2014 and I've been, I've been reading Irenaeus and assigning him since then. And there's just nothing, there's nothing quite like it. And so uh, for those of you who are turning off this podcast before you hit the off button, 
Um, what I want to, uh, this, this is a recommended reading plan because uh, the, the books are long. And it's important to, it's important to note that uh, the first two books of Against Heresies are fairly boring. Um, if you've like said, I'm going to read your Aces Against Heresies, I'm going to start from the beginning. Um, it's, it's a little bit, I don't know if I want to say like starting with Leviticus, because I really like Leviticus. <laughs> and like, uh, honestly, it's his, uh, you know, Against Heresies books one and two. It's, it's not boring because your is a boarding writer. It's, it's boring because of what your project is. So what he's doing is he is providing for the church a thorough exposition on all of the different Gnostic beliefs that he is coming in contact with in the second century, which they're, they're pluriform. Everybody, every Gnostic has their own, their own beliefs. And so that's part of the challenge. And not only is he doing an exposition of what they believe, he is refuting them, but it's not any kind of simple refutation as far as saying, well, the Bible says this, so, so you're wrong. Um, it, this is, it's, this is going to be, this is completely ac- anachronistic, but uh, uh, Irenaeus is a, is a fantastic follower of St. Thomas Aquinas in that he always goes and argues on the enemy's ground and not on his own ground. And so he's not going to try to cite some kind of authority that the Gnostics themselves wouldn't agree with. What he does is he takes the Gnostic system, he takes all their beliefs and gives the exposition and says, if this is true, if this is accurate, then how do they explain this? And how do they account for this? And he goes and shows on their own grounds the ways that these various systems that they have come up with, the way that by their own authorities, by the way that you know they reason, uh, that they that they fall apart. They they just they don't they don't work, which is which is fantastic and is a great service. But for most of us uh, who are not you know for whom second century you know Valentinianism isn't uh, the thing that keeps us up at night, uh, <laughs> it's going to be a little a little tough. And so this is what you do again. I hope you haven't turned off this yet. Um, if you're still here with us, um, start with Against Heresies book three because the first two books of Against Heresies are primarily negative in that he's telling you, this is what the Gnostics believe, this is why it doesn't work. Um, Books three, four, and five are almost exclusively positive as an exposition of the Christian faith. And they are just unspeakably good. I I can't, I don't have words to tell you how how, how good they are. So if you start with book three, um, I, I, I personally like reading on CCEL, which is the wonderful website you can read the Antonicene Fathers on, and you can uh, you can it has like you can do like an little account thing and keep all your notes and highlights. And so I've literally for eight years I've been amassing Irenaeus highlights and notes and everything. And it, you just find all these things you come back to. So I like reading on CCL. You can find it anywhere online. Um, there's there's tons of different places, uh, but read book three, book four, and book five. You know, take take your time. Uh, you'll find so much stuff, regardless of what your background is, even if, you know, you don't believe in this Christianity stuff that um, I think you will find interesting and insightful. Um, and just historically as a witness to what was Christianity, what was, you know, what were heresy and orthodoxy like in the second century uh, is extremely interesting historical witness. After you finish book five, um, if you have not already ascended into the heavenlies and you still have the ability <laughs> to use a, a computer, um, I'd recommend you read uh, Irenaeus's demonstration of the apostolic preaching, uh, which is a document that was discovered, I guess, rediscovered around 100 years ago, uh, in which we now now have. And it's, it's basically a shorter, easy, you know, it's I think I think Benedict actually described it as uh, the first Christian catechism. So it's kind of like a short summation of the central arguments of against heresies. It doesn't give it going into as much detail, but it's just it's delightful. And it's easy to it's very, very bite sized and easy to share. And then after that, go back to books one and two, because the thing that's frustrating with books one and two is you have these gold deposits in books one and two. And so I can't tell you don't read them. You absolutely should read them because there's these wonderful passages that are there. It's just once if you already have if you're already addicted from three books three, four and five. Uh, then you will, yeah, you'll, you'll have the, uh, the motivation to make it through books in one and two. So that's, that's the Irenaeus reading plan for those of you who are uh, tuning out soon. Um, if anyone would like to stay for an introduction to who is Irenaeus, why are we talking about this person? Um, he's probably born between 
130 and 140 AD um, in the East, actually. And so he's, he's an interesting ecumenical figure because he's an Eastern Christian. He, he, you know, he's a, he remembers Polycarp growing up. So Polycarp, the disciple of John, he remembers hearing Polycarp, you know, speak and everything that he did, everything that he talked about. And so he is somebody who's writing within the, you know, what we call living memory of the apostles, because he got to hear from people who themselves knew apostles like, like John. And so he, preserves this memory in his writing he, you know he has the memory of this is the way that polycarp said that john acted in this way and this is how he reacted this this kind of situation uh which is really just beautiful fun fun stuff he ends up being the bishop in Lyon, way off in the west um and uh we we have from eusebius uh eusebius's history uh preserved when you have the you know all the martyrs in Lyon in the second century uh their bishop and you know the late 100s is martyred and then Irenaeus is the one who's sent over to go and take you know take take over so he's writing uh i guess you could say um this is not some sort of peaceful detached context that he's, that he's writing in um but he what he does is is really extraordinary and putting all this material together as, as i said he is originally from the east ends up in the West, originally writes in Greek, works are largely preserved in Latin. And so when we're thinking kind of East, you know, West ecumenical stuff, uh, he is one of the fathers that I think provides uh, the best kind of ecumenical grounding because, you know, Orthodox, Catholic, and then, you know, lots of Protestants for those who, you know, who have, you have spent some time with and got some things. Everybody recognizes this guy. This is this sort of theological giant who's had a chance to, um, you know, wh whoever's had a chance to read him. So I think uh, from an ecumenical standpoint, you know, I, I think he is, he's as significant, if not, you know, the most significant saint that there is today, as far as giving a common ground for, for the unity of, of the church. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that you complimented me in the podcast and then told people to turn it off afterwards. We appreciate appreciate that juxtaposition. So if you're still listening, thank you for sticking around. Oh, I do appreciate that. I What fascinates me so much, and of course, he was named a doctor of the church uh, recently by Pope Francis, if I'm not mistaken about that. Right? To, uh, that just underscores his importance. So I guess you and the Pope are on the same wavelength in terms of how important this uh this figure is as a as a theologian, which is I, which is I wish I could tell you I had some hand in this. Um, I won't tell you that I didn't have a hand in that. If that <laughs> if that added layer of mystery goes and gets in your <laughs> What you're saying is is there was a fourth copy of your book on Amazon, but he may have bought it <laughs> and then read it and then that, Oh yeah. gosh. You know it's interesting. This is for anybody who likes to, you know, uh, interested in the book at all. That that book that chapter 11 was actually so it's, it's the, kind of the, the penultimate cha chapter is actually the, the first one that i did of the book um it was uh because he he was who, who i started with when i started to go go through the fathers um his was that that was that was what i started with i wrote sort of the second to last chapter first and then you know went went through all the rest which i was actually really grateful for because starting with Irenaeus again you know there is a Hans-Ernest von Balthasar calls Irenaeus theology's founding father, which it might seem a little like a little over the top, um, but the way that all of the pieces fit together in Irenaeus, um, it's there's a, there's a fittingness to his theology and the way that Scripture goes and integrates in his theology um, that I think what it does is it provides you a foundation. In a way, it's not unlike Aquinas. I think for for some for some people, provides a foundation to go and to engage with with everything else. And I actually found for myself, starting with Irenaeus, helped me a lot when it came to interpreting, you know, other fathers as well as well, and be able to in, intuit where they're where they're coming from. So anyway, that's a small side note. <laughs> and he, he's so important, I, I guess, because he's so early. Like you mentioned, you know, he he has the ring in his ears of of those who learned from the apostles, and he gives such a detailed picture of that early church. Like we're talking second century, but that's that's pretty recent from when the church was founded. We're not talking like this isn't. I mean, I, I don't know. Second sounds a bit more distant, but this is this is pretty close to the church we see in the, in the New Testament, right? It is, yeah, and you know, different different Christians have different views 
um, and different understandings of the kind of philosophy of history that they that they that, that you know they bring to studying church, church history. And so, um, you know, for for some people, um, you know, God has been with the church and guiding the church for the past two thousand years. And so, you know, that uh, this being earlier is uh, is interesting, but not necessarily you know completely relevant because you know, God continues to guide the church in the same way all the time. Um, you'll have other people who think, yes, that's true. But the things that are in the beginning have a kind of priority um, in a way that isn't exactly the same the way scripture has, has priority, but still there is a preeminence that's there. And so we can be enriched by the tradition. I think it's right. You'll find, you'll find folks who hold to a kind of golden age theology where, um, you know, Calvin is somebody who, who's like this, who's not, I wouldn't, he's not hundred percent consistent, but he does, you know, talk about the first 500 years of the church as being this pure age uh, that, you know, he can appeal, appeal back to, and that he, you know, encourages his readers to, you know, to, to go back to, and says that he, he wants to go into, to, to emulate and to restore the church to, um, you'll find others sort of, you know, more Anabaptist tradition where it'll often be, you know, Constantine is where things, things go wrong. Um, and so, you know, any, anything before, I don't know, 300, somewhere around there. So, you know, first century, second century, third century, uh, those, that, that's, that's where the real, the real good stuff is. And, and I have some roots in those, those kinds of traditions as well. Um, and then you'll have people who just say, look, as soon as the apostles are gone, it's over. Everything's bad until I came along and I will tell you what the, <laughs> I'll tell you what the Bible really, really means. Um, and, uh, I admire the confidence that's there. Uh, I definitely think, you know, fortune favors the bold and that is a, that is a bold approach. Um, but I, it's uncertain to me if, um, if we can avoid sort of everybody doing what's right in their own eyes, if that's the case, if really the whole church, you know, from after the apostles up until me or up until, you know, uh, you know, the apostle Keith Little or whatever, um, if, if that's who we're, who we're going to go with and designate as the apostle, if everybody else is wrong and just this kind of one narrow group is right. Um, that to me seems like a view that uh, can disintegrate pretty easily because of course your canon of scripture, which is a tradition will, will disintegrate and lots else will disintegrate as well. And um, I think what you will find is that it kind of, you end up in a sort of solipsism in the end where it's just sort of, you're just talking to yourself about your, about yourself. So um, all that to say, regardless of what kind of, you know, historical paradigm that you, you, you adopt, um, there is significance to sources that are this, this early. I think that there's, you know, ecumenically, I think they're important. And I, and I think even for those who are looking at this purely historically and not from a standpoint of, a particular faith commitment or maybe people whose faith commitments are, you might say, um, a, a bit more tentative. If that is the case where one's faith commitments are a bit more tentative, then I think that sources like this who are writing within the living memory of the apostles themselves are especially valuable as, you know, just from a historical standpoint. And if that's the case, if one regards, you know, if if one's faith commitments go and follow from the historical realities, then figures in these, you know, first first century or two are there, I think are especially helpful for going and getting to what are those historical realities that we're talking about with you know with Christ and in the early faith. Yeah, yeah. Very well said. So if we can let's look kind of zoom out a little bit and just look at kind of the picture of the church that Irenaeus gives us. I mean, it's pretty hard to sum up the the entire church. I mean, you have a book just on one narrow topic of, of what he writes about, but are there is there something we can say about what the church looks like th as Irenaeus describes it kind of in general? Like what is, is there, is that a possible question to answer? Uh, I mean, uh, all things are possible for him who believes, Keith. Uh, what, what I can do, I can, I can, uh, I can read a passage from you. This is uh, from the first book of Against Heresies. Um, what Irenaeus does here is he contrasts the church here in the, you know, and this is around 180 AD with the various Gnostics. And the Gnostics, it's, I guess you could say, the Gnostics have a radical 
individualism. If you just think of the word Gnostic, you are those who have knowledge. So everybody else has kind of, you know, the sort of the regular uh, pedestrian kind of knowledge. The Gnostics have the secret knowledge. They have sort of the special sauce that, you know, Jesus was keeping for his secret special friends. Uh, and each of them has their own secret special sauce. And if you, what's interesting is actually, if you go through it, you just think, gosh, this this is the secret special sauce because most of them, uh, I had my, my friend, my friend, Ryan Suzuki, uh, who is, uh, fantastic. He, I think he, he first gave me this analogy, uh, which was, um, that what, what the Gnostics are like, uh, are like, uh, Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter, um, where they take this historical figure and then they put him in a different narrative. Uh, it's just, you know, a real concrete, everybody knows who this person is. Well, great. Let's just put them in a different story. And so that's kind of what reading the Gnostics is like. They take this Jesus Christ figure and great, cool, amazing guy. But like, what if he hunted vampires uh, or, <laughs> you know, fill, fill in the play. it's all these other kind of weird stories. You're just thinking like, that is like, a, you know, it's, it, it does have that president by day, hunter by night feel to it, um, for those of you who are uh, fan, fans of that, of that movie. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's what the Gnostics are. That's what they're doing. And they each, you know, it's their, it's their own special boast that each of them has their own individual system. They have the real secrets. And for, yeah, for usually for, you know, some low special price, they can go and let you in on their, on their se- secrets too. Um, that is contrasted for Irenaeus with the church um, and the church, uh, even though the Gnostics don't admire them for this, he says that the church says the same thing everywhere. It doesn't matter where you go. The church says the same boring thing. We have, we have, you know, we have one voice and because of that, it doesn't matter if you're smart or if you're not smart. Um, those things are not, I guess you could say definitive for one's reception into the body of Christ and participating in the life of God that he shares through the church. And so I'll read this one passage, which is Irenaeus going and uh, contrasting the church in his time with, uh, with the various Gnostic groups. So this is what he says. Uh, this is from uh, book, uh, book one, chapter 10. As I have already observed, the church, having received this preaching and this faith, although scattered throughout the whole world, yet as if occupying but one house, carefully preserves it. She also believes these points of doctrine, just as if she had but one soul, and one in the same heart, and she proclaims them, and teaches them, and hands them down with perfect harmony, as if she possessed only one mouth. For although the language of the languages of the world are dissimilar, yet the import of the tradition is one and the same. For the churches which have been planted in Germany do not believe or hand down anything different, nor do those in Spain, nor those in Gaul, nor those in the East, nor those in Egypt, nor those in Libya, nor those which have been planted, sorry, established in the central regions of the world. But as the Son, that creature of God, is one and the same throughout the whole world, so also the preaching of the truth shineth everywhere and enlightens all men that are willing to come to a knowledge of the truth. Nor will any one of the rulers of, in the churches, however gifted he may be in point of eloquence, teach doctrines different from these, for no one is greater than the master. Nor, on the other hand, will he who is deficient in power of expression inflict injury on the tradition. For the faith being ever one and the same, neither does one who is able at great length to discourse regarding it make any addition to it, nor does one who can say but little diminish it. So that's what the church is like in, uh, yeah, in, in, in 180 from Irenaeus' in Irenaeus's standpoint. And that, that unity is really a mark of what it means to be part of Christ's body. He, you know, he writes in a period where the unity that Christ had prayed for was still largely a reality and was recognizable both to those on the inside and those on the, to, on the outside. <laughs> so what you're saying is the church was completely incoherent and diverse and no unity whatsoever in, in, in the early church. Exactly. That's, uh, that's precisely it. It was <laughs> the, the, the current cacophony that one, one yeah. sees is, uh, yeah, there it is. Yeah. 
That's interesting. It's so fascinating to me that it's so it's so early on that that unity was still there. And of course, there are these Gnostics that he's writing against, right? So there is there there are elements of disunity uh, in in well in in people who profess to follow Jesus, but the church is still quite visible and quite united. And you can you can easily point to to there, you know, where it is. Yeah. So two things to say to that. One is that it's interesting with the Gnostics, um, they're their sort of special boast usually has to do more with having the secret knowledge about Jesus than actually following Jesus, which is quite a <laughs> distinction. So this is one of the things that Irenaeus talks about is like, you know, if you ever have, if you're ever curious, hey, where is the true church? Look where the martyrs are. Because, and he, he actually, it's interesting, he goes and concedes. There are like one or two mar- like Gnostics who have, who have been martyred. But in general, the Gnostics have nothing to do with that. They have no interest in anything like that. Um, whereas, you know, the church has her, you know, her legions of martyrs and, you know, he's, he's now the bishop of a church that's, um, you know, lost all of its primary, prominent, uh, you know, members to its martyrdom. And so um, it is, you know, those who are actively seeking to, you know, to, to, to follow Christ, um, they seem to be pretty easily recognizable within you know, the, the, ma- the mainstream, you know, kind of Christian Christ church of this, of this point. The, the second thing I'll say is that even though, you know, that's, that's, that's correct that I think that unity is a real thing within Irenaeus's day and not simply, you know, some, some kind of uh, hypothetical idea. Um, it's still something that the church really has to contend for. And Irenaeus is somebody who ends up having, a really big role in that. Oh, okay. And so you have with the court of Desmond controversy, um, which when you actually get to the, you know, when you get to the heart of it, it's a really tricky controversy because, you know, the, it, it goes to the idea. So the court of Desmond controversy is, do you celebrate the Passover on the 14th of Nisan following the, the Jewish calendar, which is not referring to the vehicle, but it's the day that's on there. It has one <laughs> S instead of two S's. Anyway, um, just in case anyone's yeah. confused, yeah. there's some sort of product placement going on here. That's not it. Um, I do not endorse Nissans. No, um, so do you, do you follow the 14th of Nissan? Do you follow the Jewish calendar and, uh, and celebrate Easter along with the Jewish Passover? Or do you follow the standard record Roman calendar that everybody else goes and follows and don't kind of adhere to the more Jewish sorts of practices? Well, you might think, well, that's sort of a dumb thing to fight over like why would you why would you bother well there's two things one is that easter is the biggest deal and if you're going to have you know unity of the church you want to on your main sort of thing that you celebrate together um your main liturgical celebration you want to be able to do that in unity and the difficulty historically is it seems as though the apostles didn't all do it in precisely the same way because from what Irenaeus testifies, and, and there's uh, you know lots of others who go and testify to, to this as well, um, it seems as though John the Evangelist practiced and celebrated the Passover following the Jewish calendar. So still, certain so not the Passover, Easter, still on the same day as Jewish Easter, and then taught the churches around to go and do, do the same. And so because of that, you are then asking the churches that, you know, they knew John, He's our apostle. We're around him. He's got, he has a book. You might've heard of it. Uh, you're asking us to take the practice that he went and passed on to us and to leave that behind, which is pretty hard to do because, Hey, if this was good enough for an apostle, shouldn't it be good enough for us? And that's a really live question in the second century. And you can see how that would be, you know, you'd have real tension. You can make really good arguments for both sides. And so this goes back and forth. Po- Polycarp and the Pope at the time in Rome, they try to settle it in the middle second, second century. They, they can't settle it, but they say, look, we're going to maintain peace. We're going to agree to, to disagree. Later in the second century, uh, Pope Victor says, no, we've got to have unity on this question. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to excommunicate all the churches of the East that don't go and follow what I say to do. And so he says, look, if you're continuing to follow the, you know, the Jewish Passover thing here, um, you're, you're, you're out uh, because we need to have unity here. And this is all confusing and weird. And Irenaeus goes and counsels him and says, no, I don't think that this is prudent. And it's interesting. He doesn't go and say, I don't think that you have the authority to do this. 
I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't question that. He recognizes his authority. But he rec- it, what, he, what he questions is whether this is the wisest course of action. And he appeals to I mean, exactly what I, what I told you. He appeals to the prior apostolic tradition and also to his own predecessors and those who were recognized as saints. And just look, this is one of those things where we wish there was an easy solution to this. But the saints that preceded us, people like Polycarp, they just recognize, look, this is something in which we can agree to disagree. And if that's the case, if they can maintain peace over this, then I don't think that there's there's a real strong grounds to go and, you know, to excommunicate people over it. And he persuades Pope Victor. It's this, like, really beautiful moment in church history uh, where he he listens and it preserves it preserves peace and so Irenaeus it, I mean his name literally you know means you know like peaceful it's, he's, he's a peacemaker and so Eusebius has this quote where he's like you know, he's a man you know worthy of his name because when it came to the hard work of maintaining the unity of, of the church uh, it wasn't simply some sort of nice idea he you know he really had to had to contend for it as I think you know we're all in our own ways yeah, you know Paul yeah. called to as well so <laughs> That's so fascinating that it was such a hard won unity and so important to, to maintain that unity. And it wasn't just something that was taken for granted or that was magically possible through the work of the Holy Spirit. It was something they actually had to to, to, to pray and discuss and, and fight for. I think that's so interesting. Let's talk a bit more about the structure of the church in Irenaeus' time. Like what, do we, what do we learn about how the church is structured in, in at at that early age, obviously it's united, like we've described, it's a unity that they're fighting for, but what does it look like? How is it, how is it laid out? How is, how is it governed? How is it uh, um, planted and spread? What does it look like in Irenaeus' time? Yeah, this is where we get into sneaky Catholic stuff, isn't it? <laughs> this is that, this is the sneaky Catholic section of, oh, uh, of, of the evening. Uh, well, look, I, I, I gotta tell you, I mean, I began reading him, and I wasn't Catholic, and I kept, I bumped into these ideas that, like, I mean, doesn't he list some popes at one point? Like, I mean, I I struggle with these things. I did, yeah. and I I don't. I mean, I, I will let listeners draw their own conclusions. But when we get begin to dig into um, any of these topics, we could pick structure or some of the beliefs or doctrines. I think we're going to start bumping into sneaky Catholic things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They should you should retitle you should retitle this the sneaky Catholic. <laughs> This is the, it's not that you're not cordial, yeah. but you're just so sneaky, Keith. I'm also sneaky. Um, yeah, so this is this is one of those areas where um, when you look in the beginning of book three, which is where he begins the positive exposition of what, you know, what the Christian faith is. Um, so he's no longer just saying, hey, on Gnostic ground, I'm going to go and, you know, refute, refute the Gnostics. Is, this is positively what, what Christianity is. Um in the beginning of, of uh, book three, in chapter three, he gives an enumeration of the you know, bishops of the various various churches. And he, he just basically says, like, it would be tedious to go and give you all the churches. So I'm going to give you the, you know, the most preeminent church and the church that everybody else needs to agree with on account of its greater authority, the Church of Rome. And then he goes and gives you the bishops of the Church of Rome going all the way you know, back to, it's interesting because he goes and he mentions both Peter and Paul as those who laid down their lives and laid down their, you know, their, their, their blood upon the church. Um, and then, you know, goes, goes forward and gives you, gives you the list that's there. And it's interesting, you know, in Irenaeus, I guess what one could say, it depends on what kind of background one, one comes from because one is approaching this from an Orthodox or Catholic standpoint. Um, this, you know, there's nothing really, controversial here nor does it seem to be of anything of controversy for, for Aaron Ness. he's he's giving you sort of basic history that everybody knows and doesn't recognize this um from uh, a Protestant standpoint and particularly if you are you know uh, I guess you know from like a you know some sort of non-Anglican Protestant um because I guess Anglicans can still be like yeah we still recognize it some, some, some kind of way um something like that can be can be a little bit jarring I would I would say um because of how early this is and already seeing from you know from early on um the recognition of the you know the preeminent seat of authority that the roman church has and the fact of the succession of you know of bishops going all the way back to to the apostles and so um you know, I know, I know what you, what you, what you mean, Keith. It is one of those things where, uh, when you're going, th- when you're going through it, Irenaeus, um, you know, if you're not ready for it, uh, it can, 
it can uh, it can be sneaky, and it can it can be something that goes and catches catches you off guard if if one um, as I think many do come into when they first encounter the father thinks that things like you know the the primacy of the Roman bishop, for example, is some sort of way later development, some post Constantinian or medieval kind of thing. Um, but here in Irenaeus, this is just basic to historic Christianity already in his day, you know, in, in, in 180. So that, I think that is, um, that can be, uh, it can be a bit jarring. I do think it's important to say, you know, if one's thinking from Irenaeus' standpoint, um, I mean, Irenaeus would think this is really interesting historically that that this is something that ends up being a you know, point of controversy because there are real point of controversy, you know, points of controversy in the second century. That's what he's dealing with is heresies. And here is the sort of basic, you know, point of agreement, which, you know, centuries and centuries, you know, later, uh, you know, be contested. And so, it, you know, if it's one of those things where if one doesn't, uh, if one doesn't take Irenaeus's word for it, then I think, you know, or if, if one sort of questions, hey, where is this guy coming coming from? Um, is he some sort of uh, secret Jesuit that was found a time machine and was sent sent back in time to go and uh, do these things? Um, I think the best thing to do is to see, you know, historically how this what you see goes, you know, is corroborated by the other sources that you find in the early fathers elsewhere, which is I think is, is also fairly substantial. It would be a Jesuit too, going back in time. If if everyone were going back in time, it would definitely be. It Jesuit would definitely that would, be a Jesuit that, with a time do that. Yeah, yeah, back in time, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think it is so interesting because it is so, oh, it is so early and so taken for granted, as you say. Like, it's not one of the controversial issues. He is not, like, writing against these Gnostics to say, look, we, we, we have a pope and it's important. We have this primacy of, of Rome, whatever this is, and this is important. That's not the point he's making. He, he's just kind of outlying or outlining what everyone kind of takes for granted in, in the Christian world. Not even not not defending the primacy of Rome, as you would expect if it was a contested issue back then, but r really just assuming it. Right? Is it is that fair to say? Because that that by itself is kind of shocking, for for a non-Catholic reader of Irenaeus. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it depends on where you're coming from. Again, um, you know, for Orthodox readers, um, in in general, the Orthodox readers of, of Irenaeus that I've come across. You know they recognize they recognize the point, and in, just with Orthodox in general too. This is something I think is really helpful ecumenic, ecumenically. You know, I remember hearing um, Metropolitan Callistus where Callistus where uh, go and you know talk about Eastern and Western unity, and he was talking about Ir Irenaeus. And one of the things that he he said was that the you know between Orthodox and, and Catholics, the issue isn't so much. The, the fact of Petrine primacy, it's the outworking of Petrine primacy. It's granted that there is a, a, you know, a historic primacy that you see attested in Irenaeus, which you see attested in you know, plenty of other places in early Christianity as well. Granted that fact, how practically should that, you know, should that, that primacy be, be, wor be worked out? And you see throughout the history of the church, uh, you know, a variety of answers to that as far as how expansive that, you know, that, that prime, that primacy is, how in detail does that primacy, you know, if, if there is a universal ministry, so, so to speak, um, how, uh, I guess, how, how universal is it? If it is universal, how much in detail, uh, for all of these specific, you know, if you're appointing bishops and, you know, in one, in one church in a far off place, you know, what is the, how far does that extend versus, you know, the local authority of the bishops that are there? And that is, you know, his, historically, um, I think if uh, I think it's, it's good to be as, as, you know, as fair to the Orthodox as, as possible. I think they recognize, you know, those who I think are you know, the fathers and are at least somewhat ecumenically like, open minded recognize the fact of that Petra and primacy is just, well, how do you work it out practically? And it's in working out the details that's that's where you get you know that's where you get this kind of schism that's where you get the you know the the you know the difficult hi historical stuff um but the fact itself isn't one that that orthodox dispute uh which i think is helpful um when those who are from protestant backgrounds are engaging with someone like your nice and seeing like yeah even you know folks like the orthodox who don't necessarily uh you know want to sign up for uh you know uh you know, to receive Pope Francis Christmas cards, things like that. Uh, that there still is a, a recognition of of this this fact, which I think ecumenically as a baseline, 
is um yeah is is, is significant yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a fantastic point. So what about the kind of beliefs that the the church in Irenaeus' time held to? I'm thinking of things, um, you know, things like baptism or, or communion or things like, um, I don't know what else we, we could talk about. There's all kinds of different topics. I don't pick a few of your greatest hits, but what, what are some of the things that he shows us that that church believed uh, at that early date that he is that he's describing? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, you know, this is um, that the first the first lecture I did on Irenaeus, which is back in 2014, uh, is is called uh, "Theology of Saint Irenaeus: uh, Heresy and Orthodoxy in the Second Century," and there is and I, I gave it a second time in 2015. Um, my friend Luke Newman's uh, in his uh, in his living room uh, with a bunch of twenty something friends, and all of our fr- I was I was still in my twenties. Everybody there is their twenties. It is uh, the maturity level at no point exceeds twenty years old. <laughs> if if one goes, and that is that is on the on the on, I think it's on YouTube somewhere. Uh, if anybody's interested, and it goes it goes through a lot of the fun details as far as what does Irenaeus say about scripture? What does he say about you know? Uh, it, it, I I go through five five areas. So I go through you know Irenaeus on the incarnation, Irenaeus on scripture. Irenaeus on the church, and so he talks about some of what we just talked about now. Um, Irenaeus on the Eucharist, and then Irenaeus on uh, on Mary. And it's interesting because in each of these areas, this isn't um, saying, hey, this is Irenaeus, but from Irenaeus' standpoint, he is just trying to pr- give the positive presentation of what Christian orthodoxy is. And so, it, you know, he's it's not like, hey, I'm, you know, it, I mean, Irenaeus sees himself as a deeply unoriginal theologian and from his standpoint that is his primary virtue is his his unoriginality the fact that he is passing on to you faithfully what it is that the apostles have have given and so um if you look at a couple of these so for instance you know uh, scripture Irenaeus is really interesting in that both when it comes to a i guess you could say the, the the canon of scripture both conceptually and from a standpoint of content you have this really developed sense already in the second century now does that mean that Irenaeus is carrying a leather-bound new testament around that's sort of you know complete with maps um it probably probably not um but it does seem as though he's dealing with, you know, there is a set of authoritative writings and that set of authoritative writings, he's often going and naming. And so that one of the things that makes Irenaeus, you know, distinct, at least from, you know, writers that we, whose writings, you know, we have, we have preserved from us from these, you know, the, the second century. is he'll say, this is what Paul writes in Galatians, which is relevant to this. And then he'll just go and start citing Galatians to you. And this is what Paul says in Ephesians. And then he'll just start citing Ephesians. And it's remarkable to see, you know, the documents that we know as, you know, the new Testament uh, already as, as authorities and this, in this, you know, this period. Um, and they really are for Irenaeus. They're, you know, they're, they're uh, what the apostles have left in writing, um, you know, as well as what they have taught in the churches. They're, they're both apostolic. They're both meant to be received to, together. And so uh, that's, you know, one of the things that's near you, know, you, you do see Irenaeus going and citing other things as, as authoritative. So like first Clement, for example, a shepherd of Hermas um, from a standpoint of the scope of the old Testament, you know, he's citing things like the book of wisdom and, you know, Baruch and Suzanne and bell and the dragon. So things like that, which depending on one's background, you know, you might not be as familiar with, you might have heard, heard of before. Uh, but it is there, there is a real sense of the way that the apostles writings, um, the way that they are meant to function as real authorities and already do function as real authorities within the life of the church. And not just like, Oh, this is the authority I have to go with it, but they're a living part of what makes Christianity, you know, what, what it is, they, you know, they vivify the church and they vivify Irenaeus himself. So it's, it's amazing as, as an expositor of scripture, he's, he's fantastic. Um, I don't want to, you know, go for, for all of those, but maybe I'll say, um, you know, I'll say one thing maybe about, about the Eucharist. Um, and if anybody's interested in, you know, more of those, or if you're interested in more of these, Keith, we can talk about more of them. Um, the Eucharist is really interesting in Irenaeus um, because 
if you know if one has read some of the early you know earlier fathers like ignatius of antioch um you know you recognize very early on it seems basic the, the idea of you know this really being christ's body and christ christ's blood so the idea of the real real presence um and what you see in earlier fathers like ignatius uh you have very explicit and then spelled out and and thought through in irenaeus um and so the way that you know the eucharist goes and gives life to our mortal bodies so that we go and we share in the life of god now uh through going and, and receiving the eucharist um, and what I think is just fascinating historically is the way in which within this period, so you know, in the late second century, Christ's real presence in the Eucharist actually seems to be less controversial than Christ's physical incarnation. It's one of those things that you think, that's weird. Doesn't everybody believe in the incarnation? And the answer is no. The Gnostics, they've sort of filtered the incarnation thing out. So when they, you know, came and started, you know, doing their Gnostic things, they thought, well, gosh, matter is bad. And how is it God going to really become a man? You know, is God's spiritual. And so that's weird. And so we don't think that he must have just, he must have looked like a man. There's no way Christ could have really, really been a man. Um, but they don't actually follow their logic the whole way through because they continue to believe in Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. And so that thing that they've inherited from Christianity, they continue believing. And so Irenaeus goes and says, why is it that you guys, if you don't believe in the incarnation, if you don't think that Christ is going to go and take on flesh, why do you still agree with us that Christ is going to become present in this bread here? Like, doesn't that seem inconsistent? If you've denied one, why do you still agree with us on the other one? And so it's interesting from, I guess you could say from the standpoint of, um, you know, within, within contemporary Christianity, one would be more familiar with those who would affirm the incarnation, but, you know, deny Christ's presence in, in the Eucharist. In Irenaeus's day, it's, it's vice versa. Uh, you know, those who are, who have kind of this special secret knowledge, they're denying the incarnation thing like, oh, that's weird. But they still hold on to the Eucharist and like, yeah, but we like this. This is cool. Yeah, that, that's that's really fascinating. I'm thinking of so many things here that like lessons we can we can take away from from these things and the importance of the unity of the church and, and fighting for that and that important, right? The the idea that that yeah the, the the Eucharist would be more you know acceptable than the incarnation, like how that that flips around. Like this picture of the early church is really fascinating through the the lens of of Irenaeus. I want to do a bit of a contrast for our last little bit of time we have here, and I want to just think of these things because I'm thinking of how listeners to, the, to this show. I'm thinking of some of our non-Catholic Christian audience, some of those who are who are new Catholics who may have come from different Christian backgrounds and and are recently becoming Catholic. How they would encounter somebody like Irenaeus, how I certainly encountered him. My friend Rod Bennett encountered him. You know how you may have encountered him when you were began to read him. Here I would have been as a non-denominational evangelical, you know, Pentecostal. My background we called it Bapticostal because there was no real charismatic people in the church. So, so uh, uh, but Pentecostal in name. I would have come to say baptism as as a symbol, you know, the, the Eucharist as a symbol. A lot of these things that that we now as Catholics call sacraments, just as as mere symbols, and we would have thought that someone like Irenaeus would have affirmed us in that understanding. I would have said, yeah, for sure, the early church. I read my Bible. It seems like there's enough places where it looks like a symbol that it, it would be a symbol. You know, on a, on a Sunday morning, the if it was a communion Sunday once a month, the pastor would would read a passage from say Corinthians and would somehow slip the word in that this is like my body. The, the little word is going to get slipped in there as he reads the scripture, which is, is that's got to be heretical if you're coming from Irenaeus's point of view to, to add words to scripture. But put that aside for a minute. I I wonder what he would have or how we would how we would see him responding to ideas like that, because I would have thought that he would have said, yeah, of course, these things are symbolic, baptism, Eucharist. Is that the kind of thing we find in, in Irenaeus and the picture that he gives to us of the, the church of the second century? Like those kind of, these things are mere symbols. I mean, on the Eucharist, I think you've already said no. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the easy answer is 
No, they're not mere <laughs> symbols. <laughs> no, and I we'll can just say, leave it there. It's one of those things where you know I could I could say that kind of re- re- repeatedly, but I honestly think the you know with with all these things we were talking about the fathers, all this kind of stuff. You know, the best approach is to go and to find out for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with 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 all of these, because this isn't it's just a matter of like, hey, can I get the right you know in, information? I think. Um, if any anybody regardless of what you know what what uh what what context your you know your your listeners are from and say so say that you know you have you have a listener who has like it's from kind of a you know much a much lower you know ecclesial you know background uh, which is you know similar to my own background um i think even they would recognize that encountering people who are truly godly people encountering people who are truly filled with the spirit and both in person and then also through their writings is something that helps us to appreciate God more that inspires us to live our lives more fully for God and helps us to understand what that means to, to actually, actually do that. And I think Irenaeus is somebody that, if you think of somebody who, who is, who's good to spend time with, not just like, Hey, can we, can we prove that, you know, like baptism actually does stuff or can we prove that, you know, Mary actually has a, you know, a unique kind of participatory, participatory role, um, you know, within, you know, kind of the human salvation. Yeah. We, we can't, we can prove all of that, but you can still have all the right knowledge and not actually grow in holiness. Yeah. And the, I think the thing that we're encouraged to do by God and what we're tasked to do and what we're here to do is, is to actually, actually grow in holiness, actually, you know, incarnate, you know, the life of the world and actually, actually show that. And Irenaeus is somebody who I find, you know, in, in my life and, you know, in, in teaching his, his writings over the past, past eight years, um, his, uh, you know, the, the encounter with him really is an encounter with holiness. And it's something where it, it does really inspire you uh, to want to live the life that God has has given you know to each of us to live uh, in a, in a more full and honestly joy, joyful way. And so, um, yeah, the answers are absolutely important, and the answers I think are are all there. And I frankly don't even find them to be, you know, once you actually spend time in these things, I don't think that. The, you know these things are, are particularly controversial but don't just think like okay well i've got the answers and so that's that that's it i think that the encounter with somebody who really is filled i think uniquely with the spirit of god and who is who has acted uniquely as as a disciple is something that god uses in our lives to push us on you know to to, to great greater heights and so um th- i almost want to say i uh, you know, Keith, I'm not going to answer your question. You just, you're going to have to listen to it for yourself. So, you know, uh, scrub scrub the tape. I, Keith, I don't really know if baptism does something. You, Chris, I'm not really sure. If uh, Listeners, if you could go check this out for me and then report back to Keith, that'd be fantastic. That's fantastic. You're a real hero, Matthew, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, you know, I was thinking this the, just today. Actually, I was I was walking uh, walking our daughter to, in, well, walking the kids to school, uh, pushing the baby back in the stroller on the way home, and I was thinking about the the uh, what what happened? What's what that? Was that noise? Did something die? No, I don't know. I heard. I just heard a giant like. Thought a, I thought a vacuum was like just coming to life and going to consume you. Oh no! That was weird. That sounds awful. I hope maybe that it was on my, happen. Maybe it's on my end. I don't know. We have, yeah, maybe it we was a uh, robot vacuum. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll that over that's, again. that's possible. I don't even know where to... So your daughter yeah, okay. was you're taking your daughter to school, and this robot vacuum comes out of nowhere <laughs> and, and consumes your daughter. I'm not going to edit this out of the out of the YouTube video. I'll edit the podcast. This is going to be great for the listener. Little Easter egg. I was thinking of this today on the way to walking the kids to school. I was thinking about the the importance of maybe semi regularly examining your beliefs, right? Like looking at you know reading the scriptures and and thinking, okay, and trying to read these from a, from a from a non biased lens, right? Because we we all come to the scriptures, we come to reading, say, the early church fathers, uh, with 
with a background, like with inherited beliefs, you know, with the worldview that we already have, that we hold. And I'm, I'm thinking of, of the importance of, of trying to, you know, listen to the Spirit, listen to what God is telling you, and read those things w- with new eyes, right? As often, as, as much as possible when we begin to read something. And I'm, I'm thinking what you just said here, this, this challenge for listeners, right? To, you know, go see, go see for yourself. And I think that's important. Like there's, you know, even for somebody who's, who's, you know, I, I read those and honestly, I was, was drawn towards the Catholic faith. That was where I, the conclusion that I, I landed on listeners know this, not surprise. When I read those, those early church fathers, but I think for anybody, even for the for, for the Catholic listener, I think it's important to go back to the scriptures, go back to the, the church fathers and read those things with fresh eyes and really see what they're saying and, and try and piece that out of the worldview you may be bringing into that thing. And, and I think that there's something in, in that experience, in that journey, I think for everybody just to do that. And I think it's an important exercise that we need to, need to do as, as Christians to yeah. not just be like... Somewhere in somewhere in the New Testament, somewhere I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know where I say it, but facetiously, we're told not to just you know to be careful of man-made beliefs, right? Be careful of man-made religion, and I think we fall into that trap if we just inherit, you know, a worldview and never kind of shake it up a little bit, right? Yeah, is that, you, is that you the challenge. You <laughs> no, you have an awesome point, Keith. I think that's I think what you said is really important, and it's oh, one of those things that I think <laughs> if you add, Keith, I mean, everything you say is really important. I'm really surprised. Thank you. And this is this is just another thing to add to the list. Yeah. Um, no, it's if if you think of this in terms of I mean, if, like limit it to sort of Protestants and, and, and Catholics. You know, somebody who has real you know deep debts on you know sort of both both sides. Um, what I can say is that if you're using math analogy. You can have somebody who's sort of born with the answer key, who has all of the right answers. Does that make them a good mathematician? Well, not by virtue of that. It's like if you're trying to become a ma- good mathematician, can having the right you know answer key be helpful? Absolutely, it can be. It can be really helpful the way you know all this goes and stuff goes and fits, fits together. Um, it's 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 great, um, but that by itself doesn't go and make you a mathematician. Um, and you can imagine, it's, it's fun, carry the analogy. Imagine somebody who isn't you know, born with that you know, answer key has to kind of do stuff for, the, for themselves and really has to work and wrestle with things. It ends up making a lot of mistakes along the way. But in the process, even though they might have a lot more wrong answers to go into show for along the way, by the end, they end up with, you know, they, they've become a mathematician. They've learned to think mathematically. And the person on the other side who just might has, has the answer key might not really have thought much at all. Just like, yeah, I know the answer is it's there and you just kind of go on with your life. So you don't really worry about it. And what's funny is you can have, and boy, if I haven't seen this in real life, you can have the person who's from the non-answer key background that uh, who's worked at all this stuff all their life, come across the answer key and be like, that's amazing. Which is, you know, often for people like the first time they encounter the catechism or something like that, they think they open this thing and they're just like, that is amazing. And then they appreciate the thing five times as much as the person who was raised with it, who didn't necessarily think about it, you know, much one one, one way or the other. And so, you know, I I think you're, I think just what you said is so important that the, um, the Kierkegaard has, has this great line where he says, you know, no more, no man can know more of the truth than he is of the truth. No man can know more of the truth than he is of the truth. That if you think because you've got the right answers that you really know the truth, you're wrong you don't actually really know it you you can't know more of it than you actually are than you actually embody and part of embodying it is this is this wrestling is this examination and is this like really active i mean this is i think a a large part of what christ says when he's talking about loving god with your whole mind it doesn't mean just having the right answers. <laughs> Let me tell you that. It doesn't mean just having the answer key and being able to refer back to it on the rare occasion that you start to think about this. Um, it it means loving God actively with your whole mind. And I think that again, if, if you're thinking of the Protestant, you know, Catholic divide, there's there can absolutely be be Protestants who I think set really good examples for for Catholics, even if they you know, make some, some mistakes along the way from that really active engagement um, with wanting to know the truth of God with their minds. 
<laughs> That's very well said. I, I, and I love any good math analogy. So, so thank there you. There it is. Yeah. Well, it was just footnotes to your point. Honestly, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Just footnoting me. I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's all you're doing here, isn't it? Yep. Uh, Dr. Matthew J. Thomas, this has been a really fun episode. I, I appreciate you coming back on here. Uh, it won't be the last time, I, I don't think. Um, people can't buy your book anywhere. It's sold out anywhere, so they can't really do anything beyond listen to this. But uh, you suggested they go read Irenaeus, so that's a, that's a good place to start. Um, anywhere you want to point them towards? Anything else? You mentioned uh, Living Room Lecture when you were 20. You want, They might want to look up on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's on YouTube somewhere. Uh, I, think it's on the, I think it's on the East Bay Hockey League website. This is one of those okay. things. Uh, you might not know this about me, Keith, but um, I'm the president of a fake hockey league, okay. um, which is a, a good thing to have on your resume, yeah. I found. I should have um, added that to the bio at the beginning of the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, gosh, we're, we're coming up on, it's established 2004. So it'll be, it'll be 20 years of imitation hockey coming up pretty, wow. pretty soon here. Wow. Uh, so anyway, so I think it's, it's, I think, on that YouTube page. Uh, and if you're looking for more Irenaeus and a lot of, you know, 20 somethings talking about, you know, the church fathers, uh, that's, that's a, a blast and has lots of great, great fun material in it. Um, but I honestly, I have nothing to promote. I just think <laughs> you should go read Irenaeus. Even if I wanted you to buy my book, you, you, you can't because can, there's no. been a run on it um, yeah. because of the economy is crashing. Yeah. Uh, so there's nothing else I can give you. And I honestly have nothing else to give you besides oh, that, that read sounds... Irenaeus, have your life changed and um, become more fully the saint that God has created you to be. Well, that sounds fantastic. Amen. Uh, look forward to having you back on the show when you have something to promote, if you ever do anything else with, <laughs> with, with your life, Dr. Thomas. And I do appreciate it. It's it's a lot of fun. I want to say God bless you. God bless your hockey league, your ministry with the church, the work that you do, the writing, uh, which is theologically explosive, I've heard. Thank you for, for exploding all over our podcast uh, this week, Dr. Thomas. <laughs> Thanks, Keith, I think. <laughs> 